Welcome to the Evidence Based Hair Podcast for the October 17, 2022 issue, Season 3, Episode 2. Evidence Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy and addresses new research in the field of hair loss. We'll use our time together to talk about a variety of issues in hair loss. We'll talk about what's new, but we'll also reflect on how all this new information ties in with what we've come to learn in the past. And we'll think carefully about where we're heading in the future as a hair loss community. I'll use various studies each week as a pivot point to discuss key diagnostic pearls and treatment tips that hopefully allow us all to become better practitioners. This podcast was created for practitioners of various backgrounds, but regardless of whether you care for patients with hair loss or simply care about the topic of hair loss, this podcast will be of interest. This podcast was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The third Monday of each month is dedicated to scarring alopecia, and that's where we will be turning to today. I'll be discussing eight interesting studies from the past few months in the area of scarring alopecia. We'll start out by talking about some comorbidities in lichen plano pilaris, are you aware of all the medical conditions that can occur in patients with lichen plano pilaris? Well, the data is changing, and a fascinating study last year by Dr. Connick and colleagues suggested that high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome is increased in patients with lichen plano pilaris. Two new studies have recently been published again looking at the medical comorbidities that exist in patients with lichen plano pilaris. I'd like to review these with you. I think they're very, very important. They give us new insights into the array of medical conditions that may be occurring in our patients with lichen plano pilaris. Then we'll talk about eyebrow hair loss in FFA. In 2014, my colleague Dr. Vano from Spain published some wonderful data. At that time, the largest study in FFA, 355 patients. And in that 2014 study, Dr. Vano suggested that eyelash loss, body hair loss, and facial papules were really important prognostic factors that predicted poor prognosis. Well, what about eyebrow loss? Does it have any significance? Well, the data to date has suggested that perhaps it does, and perhaps it's a more minor uh, prognostic factor. We'll take a look at an interesting study looking at eyebrow loss. Then we'll take a look at a study addressing the age of patients with FFA that are arriving in clinic. A nice study by Dr. Goldberg suggesting that the patient's seen in her clinic over the years with FFA, are decreasing in age. And the youngest patient seen each year is going down, down, down. Fascinating study that suggests that perhaps FFA is affecting younger and younger patients. And what do we do with that data? We'll take a look at this study and I'll give you my thoughts. Then we'll take a look at a study of FFA again, looking at what's going on in the normal appearing scalp. Is the normal appearing scalp normal, or is the normal appearing scalp actually abnormal when you look at the histology? Well, we'll see it's abnormal, and this study builds upon a very nice study in 2020 by uh, Isabella Doce, suggesting that in lichen plano pilaris and FFA, in this normal appearing scalp, There's some abnormal things going on, and perhaps these conditions are really affecting more of the scalp than we realize. We'll take a look at this new study and what it means. Then we'll take a look at lichen plano pilaris, FFA, and checkpoint inhibitors. Checkpoint inhibitors are this group of cancer drugs we've talked about before on the Evidence-Based Hair podcast that are revolutionizing cancer therapy around the world. And these medications activate the immune system so that the immune system, immune system can go about killing cancer cells. Well, when you activate the immune system, you can get autoimmune diseases and you can get autoimmune 
hair loss conditions, including lichen plano pilaris and FFA. We'll take a look at three new reports. Then we'll take a look at a really nice study by Dr. Cristiano's group at Columbia University, suggesting that maybe some of these scarring alopecias are, have more in common than we realize. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out how does FFA differ from LPP? How does CCCA differ from FFA and LPP? How do these conditions differ? Obviously, we think that if we can figure out how they differ, we can get better treatments. Well, Dr. Cristiano's group publishes a very nice study suggesting that maybe these diseases have more in common than we realize the gene signatures for fibrosis for mast cells perhaps have more in common than we've uh, ever realized before and that there's uh, some really important information that comes out of this study that we'll, we'll take a look at. And then we'll conclude by talking about alopecic aseptic nodules of the scalp, formerly called pseudocysts. AANS or alopecic and Aseptic nodules of the scalp is a condition that is a mild form of dissecting cellulitis, affects young patients. We have a couple nodules in the scalp. By trichoscopy, it looks just like dissecting cellulitis. But within a few months of treatment, the nodules disappear, hair grows back, and the clinician wonders, was this really dissecting cellulitis? I thought dissecting cellulitis was supposed to be a difficult condition to treat. Well, that was probably alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp. And we'll take a look at a really nice study looking at a variety of cases from Dr. Trube's group uh, with alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp. The references for all these studies are in the show notes that accompany the episode. So we'll begin by talking about some comorbidities that exist with lichen plano pilaris, Joshi and colleagues published a nice study in the International Journal of Dermatology looking at the comorbidities that exist with LPP. They used this database known as the All of Us database, and they've used this database in other studies that we've reported here on the Evidence-Based Hair podcast. But they used this database to ask what medical conditions go along with LPP. Well, over the last few years, a number of investigators have been asking that very question. What medical conditions go along with LPP? And the data is kind of all over the place because studies have been relatively small. Connick and colleagues last year published a wonderful study in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology, which was one of the top 20 studies of 2021. And you can certainly check that out in prior uh, our prior YouTube video, which is which is online. But it was a really wonderful study because it was a very very large study, and Dr. Connick and colleagues compared 3,000 LPP patients with 63 million controls, and that's what these computer databases allow us to do nowadays: is to process very large data. Well, Dr. Connick's group suggested that LPP patients have a six-fold increased risk of high cholesterol, a four-fold increased risk of high blood pressure, a five-fold increased risk of obesity, an almost three-fold increased risk of diabetes, and a ten-fold increased risk of metabolic syndrome. This was a particular surprise, some of this data, because we really weren't aware that the cardiovascular risks in LPP pa patients were so great. The same study suggested that perhaps there's a twofold increased risk of coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, and heart attacks in patients with LPP. This was a surprise because some, some previous data had suggested in the literature that LPP patients are at reduced risk for cardiovascular disease. Well, this conic study from 2021 was the largest of its kind looking at these medical conditions that can coexist with LPP. And so now we have two new studies looking at these medical comorbidities. Joshi used the All of Us database to look at some medical comorbidities. And so they performed 
a nested case control study uh, looking into this database in April 2022, looking at patients that had a diagnosis of LPP coded by L66.1 ICD-10 CM coding. And so patients with an L66.1 code have LPP, but they could have classic LPP and they could have frontal fibrosing alopecia. So this Joshi et al. study doesn't allow us to differentiate between LPP and FFA. So we have to keep that in mind when we go about looking at this data. But the cases and controls um, were uh, conducted via looking at the L66.1 code and then control. Each case was matched to four age, race, and sex matched controls. What did they find? Well, some pretty interesting data. They found that the risk of psoriasis was increased some 47-fold in patients with LPP, atopic dermatitis, 27-fold increased risk compared to controls. There was an increased risk of cancer, six-fold increased risk of melanoma, five-fold increased risk of basal cell cancer, four-fold increased risk of squamous cell cancer. There was an increased risk of rosacea, almost five-fold. Some autoimmune diseases were increased, a fourfold increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease, threefold increased risk of rheumatoid arthritis, threefold increased risk of lupus, a threefold increased risk of ischemic heart disease, an almost threefold increased risk of insomnia. Again, similar to Connick and colleagues, a twofold increased risk of hyperlipidemia, twofold increased risk of hypothyroidism an almost twofold increased risk of high blood pressure, as well as an increased risk of depression and anxiety, uh, and a decreased risk of heart failure. There was no link or association that they could find with obesity, vitiligo, diabetes, or smoking. So this was an interesting study which highlights some associations, some associations with um, cancers, squamous cell, melanoma, basal cell, marked associations with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, associations with autoimmune diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, lupus. We can't separate LPP and FFA in this study because they're coded the same, but nevertheless that shouldn't detract from the main message that there are these important associations with patients with um, LPP, whether LPP or FFA. And I think this is pretty important because it certainly um, validates some prior studies and you know paves the way for additional studies in this area that there, there are these issues. And like all good studies, it opens the door for additional studies. Well, what do we do with this information? If patients with LPP truly are at increased risk for heart disease, then do we need to start screening patients with LPP for heart disease in ways that we haven't thought about before? Certainly patients with LPP probably should be screened with cholesterol levels and measuring of their blood pressure, um, blood sugars perhaps. The Connick study suggested there's this risk of metabolic syndrome. This Joshi study suggests, yes, there's this risk as well. I don't think we fully understand what to do with this information, but it's, it's, it's certainly relevant. What do we do with the potential increased risk of skin cancers? Do we screen patients with LPP who come through the door? Do we make sure they've had full skin exams at the dermatologist? We don't know. The answer is probably. Um, certainly good histories are needed. Uh, is there family histories? Have there been prior uh, lesions? But probably the answer is yes, that full skin examinations may be necessary. We don't know. This is new data. This is an emerging field of these disease associations, but I think we need to be thinking about it. What do we do with the fact that there's an increased risk for inflammatory bowel disease? Well, we don't know, but certainly patients with diarrhea and bloody diarrhea, you know, may need to be seen by gastroenterology a little more urgently for the possibility that they may have underlying um, bowel disease. I think these are important studies, these 
These studies are challenging to do by digging into databases and trying to perform good case control studies, but they highlight these associations and really remind us that our patients come through the door asking us for help with hair loss, but we can help them not only with their hair loss, but by appreciating these disease associations, we can dramatically help their health in other areas and refer them to the appropriate specialists for help. Another study by Nassimi and colleagues from Iran looked at another case control study looking at disease associations in patients with LPP. This study shows different data, and that's okay. I think that these, cha these studies are challenging to do to look at associations. This is a retrospective case control study looking at specifically LPP patients. There was no FFA patients in this study by Nassimi and colleagues. The authors enrolled patients with biopsy-proven LPP between 2013 and 2018. The control group consisted of patients that did not have LPP, but were matched for sex and age and, and body mass index. So there was 208 LPP patients, 208 controls. There was 76.9% women. The mean age of patients was about 45 years, 47 years in the case group and 42 years in the control group. In LPP patients, there was uh, about 17% of patients having thyroid disorders, 12% having hypertension, 41% having lipid abnormalities, cholesterol issues, and 5% having cardiovascular disease. The authors found that high blood pressure and heart disease were lower in LPP, Lipid abnormalities were higher in LPP and no difference in thyroid disease. So somewhat different data than we saw in the Joshi et al. study and different data than we saw in the Connick et al. study. This was a study of LPP patients. We have data from Connick suggesting that there's an increased risk of hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and certainly um, that was suggested by the Connick et al. study. The data from 2020 and before was all over the place in terms of the relationship between high cholesterol and LPP. Some studies suggested yes, some su studies suggested no. A meta-analysis in 2020 by Fan and Smith suggested there's no relationship between having high cholesterol and having LPP. But the data now with these larger and larger studies, especially the Connick et al. study, is suggesting that, you know, maybe there is. Maybe there is a relationship between high cholesterol and LPP, and certainly the Joshi et al. study suggests that there, there is. So I think over time we're going to appreciate that relationship a little bit better, but it does appear that there's a relationship between uh, dyslipidemia and LPP. I think it's really important to differentiate LPP and FFA. Um, my experience is that the two are somewhat different in cholesterol. I see a lot of patients with FFA that have extremely good HDLs. What does that mean? We don't know. But how does that factor into this dyslipidemia that we see? Is it good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Is it just bad? Is it a mixture of both? I think we, we clearly need to separate LPP and FFA when we look at these studies. What about heart disease? Well, the Nassimi study suggests there's less heart disease in LPP patients. The Connick study and the Joshi study suggest no, no, there's an increased risk of heart disease in LPP patients. I don't think we fully know, but I think that we're beginning to feel that maybe this is a true relationship, that maybe there's an increased risk of heart disease, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure in patients with LPP. The data is all over the place in various studies, so I think we need to look at good studies and use them as perhaps the, the benchmark to form our opinions.
but um, certainly the Connick et al. study is a very large study, the largest of its kind to date, and it suggests that perhaps there is. And I think as more and more data comes out and more and more of these meta-analyses are done, we may in fact find that, yes, this is a true relationship, but there's an increased risk of heart disease in LPP patients. Fascinating data. I think these large studies and well-conducted case control studies are so important um, to give us some understanding about what conditions are increased in our FFA and LPP patients. So from comorbidities, we move on to eyebrow loss. Eyebrow loss is so important to appreciate in FFA patients. Eyebrow loss is often the very first change that patients with FFA appreciate. And patients can go years and years with eyebrow loss, and many of them go years and years with eyebrow loss, being told they have alopecia areata, being told they are, you know, having thyroid disease or overplucking, when in fact they have frontal fibrosing alopecia. And so eyebrow loss is really important, but what is its prognostic significance? When you have eyebrow loss, does it mean you're likely to have a resistant form of FFA? Does it mean you're likely to have a less resistant form that responds well to medications? Well, a new study looks at the prognostic significance of eyebrow loss. This is a study from Mayo by Imhoff and colleagues, published in JAD International in August. A lot of patients with FFA have eyebrow loss, and depending on the study that you read, it's anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of patients with FFA have eyebrow loss. And so the majority of patients that you see in clinic with FFA are going to have eyebrow loss. Very few studies have looked at whether patients that don't have any eyebrow loss have a different type of prognosis. Do they have better prognosis? Do they have worse prognosis? When we think about prognostic factors in FFA, we have several studies that have looked at prognostic factors. And Dr. Vano's 2014 study, which was a study of 355 patients with FFA, which at that time was the largest study. Prior studies before 2014 had been with 20 patients, 60 patients, 70 patients. And then here comes Dr. Vano's study in 2014 with 355 patients. And it allowed the authors to identify some prognostic factors. The authors suggested that if you have eyelash loss, if you have body hair loss, if you have facial papules, you may have a form of FFA which has a little bit worse prognosis. Dr. Vano's group suggested in that study that maybe eyebrow loss is a prognostic factor too, but maybe it's a more mild prognostic factor. But this study in 2022 by Imhoff and colleagues set out to look at eyebrow loss in patients with FFA and compare it to patients with FFA who don't have eyebrow loss. So the authors performed a retrospective chart review of patients with FFA seen over the period 1992 to 2019. And patients with FFA were stratified according to whether they had eyebrow loss or did not have eyebrow loss. And then they looked at how well they responded to treatment. So the authors looked at treatment responses and categorized patients in three groups. If they didn't have a very good response at all and the disease kept going, they said the patients had unaltered disease progression, or UDP. If there was some slowing down of the disease and some kind of a treatment response, although more mild, they said the patients had a slowing of disease progression. If the patients had their disease halted, they said the patient had disease stabilization. So this Imhoff et al. study had 224 patients, 95.5% were female, the mean age of patients was around 62 years, most patients presented with scalp and eyebrow loss, that was 
what happened in about 64% of patients, and about 39% of patients in their study had total eyebrow loss. Well, what was the outcome of patients with eyebrow loss? Well, they identified 111 patients with eyebrow loss who underwent treatment, so they could look at the treatment responses. And of those 111 patients, about 50% had unaltered disease progression. In other words, in in about 50% of cases, the treatments didn't really seem to slow down the disease or alter it in any way. Then they looked at patients without eyebrow loss, and in those group of patients, about a quarter of patients had unaltered disease progression. In other words, if there was eyebrow loss, treatments were less likely to work. And overall, eyebrow loss was significantly associated with unaltered disease progression. It was much more likely if patients had eyebrow loss that the treatments just didn't seem to do much. As well, patients with eyebrow loss had a longer time for the disease to stop. It took about 812 days for remission in those with eyebrow loss compared to 503 days in patients who did not have eyebrow loss. So overall, the data shows that eyebrow loss is a prognostic factor. It's a negative prognostic factor. And patients with eyebrow loss have a more resistant disease, takes longer to become inactive. So I think this is really important. It, it reminds us that there are, there are all these prognostic factors in FFA. The eyebrows have a position in the list of prognostic factors, and they do predict a more resistant type of FFA. We stay on the topic of FFA, and we now move to a fascinating study by my colleague, Dr. Lynn Goldberg, in the U.S., titled Exploring Potential Decreasing Age of Patients with Frontal Fibrosing Alopecia. It was published in JAD International in July 2022. Do you see young patients with FFA? Well, certainly I do. Have you ever wondered if the patients that you're seeing in clinic with FFA are getting younger and younger over time? Well, Dr. Goldberg certainly did. And so she looked at all of the patients that she has seen in clinic and looked at whether they are, in fact, getting younger and younger over time. So let's take a look at this very nice study by Dr. Goldberg and her group. FFA, as you know, is increasing worldwide. Many refer to it as an epidemic. And some have proposed that not only are more and more patients with FFA being seen, but perhaps the age at diagnosis is decreasing. And so the authors of of this study set out to evaluate whether women presenting to clinic with a new diagnosis of FFA are in fact getting younger and younger than they were many years ago. And so they investigated the age that patients are presenting to clinic. They looked at data from 2005 to 2019 and looked at the age at the time of their initial visit as well as the age at which their FFA started. So they had a nice database to look at, 292 patients. 97% were female. The age at visit number one ranged from 24 to 84. And the age at disease onset ranged from 17 to 81. And so there are some very young patients with FFA in the teenage years. So I think we have to be open to that possibility. Both the age of onset and the age at first visit decreased over time, but in Dr. Goldberg's study, none of these achieved statistical significance. But the age of the youngest patient seen that year was decreasing over time. And when you look at a graph of age of visit 
of the youngest patient over time from 2005 to 2019, you can see that that curve slopes down, that the youngest patient is getting younger and younger over time. In 2005, the youngest patient was in the 40s and 50s. In 2012, it was in the 30s. And in 2019, it was entering into the um, teens and 20s. So the youngest patient seen annually is getting younger over time. And so not only is there an epidemic of FFA, but it's affecting younger and younger patients. An important question, of course, is why is FFA occurring in the first place? And that's open to debate. Are there environmental factors that are seen that just weren't present 30, 40, 50 years ago that are present on the planet now that are causing FFA? We don't know. This is debated back and forth. But is it possible that younger and younger patients are being affected, and, and why is that? The second important question, which I think is really important, is do we need to pursue any different workup in a patient who's 55 years of age and presents to clinic versus a patient 21 or 31 who presents to clinic? We've seen in these prior studies by Connick and colleagues, by Joshi and colleagues, that there are perhaps these disease associations. Perhaps patients with LPP and FFA have higher risk of metabolic syndrome, perhaps different skin cancer risk. We don't know the final answer, but Perhaps the workup that we need to do in a 55-year-old is different than the workup we need to do in a 31-year-old. I think one of the issues that needs to be addressed that isn't addressed, but one issue that I address in clinic very often is what sort of workup should we do in a premenopausal woman in the 20s, in the 30s, who presents to clinic with FFA, and has not yet completed her family and wishes to become pregnant at some point in the future. The reason this is so important is the data, especially data by Dr. Vano and colleagues in that nice 2014 study that suggests that women with FFA have an increased risk of premature menopause. And so if the age of FFA is truly decreasing over time, that means dermatologists around the world and practitioners around the world are likely to see younger and younger women presenting to clinic with FFA. The average age of menopause in the United States, Canada, Europe is around 51. About 1 in 100 women have early menopause, and in FFA that appears to be about 1 in 8 according at least to the data from Dr. Vano in 2014. And so the management of women under 40 with FFA, in my opinion, does need to include screening for early menopause. There are no guidelines that have been formally recognized, but certainly I think that's really important. And so in women under 40, who present with FFA, I generally order blood tests for estradiol, FSH, uh, as well as tests for thyroid, blood sugars, LH. But I think that screening for early menopause is certainly really, really important. And what do we do with that information? Well, certainly if there is any indication that there may be early menopause, those women need referral to uh, endocrinology for further workup or to gynecology. But I think the key question is, what do we do if there's no indication of premature menopause? When do we screen again? If a patient presents to clinic with FFA at 25, blood tests come back normal, when do we screen again? Do we screen again at 30? Do we screen again at 40? These, of course, are unknowns. We don't have any formal guidelines, but I think it's a really important issue for us to think about. And if a patient presents to clinic at 25, has FFA, and um, wishes to have a family, do we 
advise that patient any differently? Um, do we consider uh, referring to gynecology for consideration of um, egg retrieval or any other investigations like that? I think no one knows the answer, but I think that in women under 40 with FFA, I think we need to do uh, good workups. I think we need to have a very low threshold for referring to gynecology and endocrinology to help us address these very important questions. This is a very nice study by Dr. Goldberg suggesting that the age of FFA may be decreasing over time, and we are all going to be seeing patients with FFA in the teenage and early 20 years, and I think we need to know not only how to treat the scalp, but what are the other issues that coexist in these patients and how do we treat them? Who do we refer them to if there are concerns? I think these are really important questions that we all need to ask in the hair loss community. So we'll stay on FFA for a minute and talk about a very nice study by Dr. Perino Busamonte, published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in July 2022. This was a study which set out to look at what is happening on the scalp in otherwise normal appearing areas in patients with FFA. So this particular study builds upon a very nice study by uh, Isabella Doce in 2020, looking at the normal appearing scalp in patients with LPP and FFA. And her study was a study of 40 patients published in Experimental Dermatology. It was a very nice study which suggested that in normal appearing scalp, there you can expect to find inflammation. You can expect to find perifollicular fibrosis in some cases. You can expect to find mucin. So there's a lot going on in the normal appearing scalp. Clinically, and by trichoscopy, it looks normal, but there's stuff going on under the scalp. And so this was a study by Dr. Perino Busamonte looking at this question again in FFA patients. And how does, it, how does the normal scalp appear to FFA areas? And so they compared biopsies from the normal scalp to biopsies from classic FFA areas in the same patient. Well, first they looked at hair counts. Hair counts were, of course, lower in FFA areas than the normal appearing scalp. And terminal hair counts were lower in FFA areas compared to the normal appearing scalp. But what about inflammation? Well, inflammation was high in the normal appearing scalp, and inflammation was high in FFA areas. And so this is a nice reminder that if you think that there's no inflammation hiding under the scalp in an otherwise normal appearing scalp in an FFA patient, uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, and so there is inflammation, active inflammation in otherwise normal appearing scalps. So I think that's really important data because it reminds us that perhaps the immune system is patrolling other areas of the scalp that we didn't think the immune system was, in fact, patrolling. The authors went on to look at uh, vacuolar degeneration in FFA areas compared to a normal appearing area of the same patient, necrosis of the outer root sheath, and then perifollicular fibrosis. What the authors showed is that Vacuolar degeneration, outer root sheath necrosis, and perifollicular fibrosis was more commonly seen in FFA areas compared to the normal scalp. But these normal scalp areas still had these processes going on. A third of biopsies had vacuolar degeneration in the normal appearing scalp biopsy. 15% had necrosis of the outer root sheath or cell death of the keratinocytes in the outer root sheath, and 30% had perifollicular fibrosis. So there is active inflammation going on in the normal appearing scalp. What about the oil glands? 
Well, we think that loss of the oil glands or change of the oil glands is a very early step in FFA and LPP. And the authors showed that in the normal appearing scalp, about 15% of biopsies had a reduction in sebaceous glands and a quarter, 26.9% of normal appearing scalp biopsies had loss of sebaceous glands. Now, a reduction in sebaceous gland and absent sebaceous gland was more common in FFA. That's not a surprise. About 80% of biopsies had a reduction or a loss of sebaceous glands in the FFA area. But this change in the sebaceous gland is still happening to some degree in the normal appearing scalp. So I think that's particularly important. What about elastic fibers? Well, Elastic fibers are changed in about a third of biopsies from FFA and about a third of normal appearing scalp, but there was no difference between those two. And so this is a very nice study which builds upon uh, Dr. Doce's study, which reminds us that when you see a patient with FFA and you see the band of hair loss across the front or around the back and the rest of the scalp looks normal, it's important not to think that the rest of the scalp is in fact normal. It's certainly unlikely to be histologically normal. The patient may not have hair loss in other areas. The patient may not have itching, burning. The patient may not have issues. But there's still a disease process going on in many areas of the scalp. Loss of sebaceous glands, inflammation, Fibrosis is seen in other areas of the scalp. Now, it's seen more commonly in the FFA area, but it's happening in other areas. The key in this study is what do we do with this information? We can't conclude that the inflammation and loss of sebaceous glands in the other areas of the scalp means that that area is likely to lose hair in the future. We don't have that good data yet. And when we see a patient with FFA and has loss of the frontal hairline, do we need to treat systemically because we're worried about the rest of the scalp? Well, some would argue yes, but it is possible that a patient may have inflammation in other areas of the scalp, may have loss of sebaceous glands in other areas of the scalp, but hair may never be lost in those areas. And so we don't really know what to do with this information yet. That clearly we're going to get biopsies back showing inflammation, showing loss of sebaceous glands in normal appearing areas, but patients may never lose hair in those areas. Some might, but some might not. And so we need more studies to really understand what to do with this information. If you get a biopsy back and you see, oh, there's inflammation, oh, there's loss of sebaceous glands, I better treat aggressively, that may not be the right approach. That we need to treat aggressively if we see that the patient has hair loss if we see that the hairline is moving back, if we see visit to visit that the patient is losing hair, those are the main signs that should trigger us to treat aggressively. We shouldn't be treating aggressively just because we have a biopsy that comes back showing that there is inflammation or loss of sebaceous glands. We need to tie it in with the clinical picture. So simply looking at a biopsy report and seeing that there's FFA or LPP, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to treat aggressively. It might, but it doesn't necessarily. We should treat aggressively if the clinical signs suggest that there's progression or there's unpleasant symptoms or each visit the patient is losing more and more hair and the photographs document this. So we don't necessarily treat LPP and FFA if the pathology comes back showing all these features but the patient hasn't lost a single hair in the last five years, that would not be an indication to treat aggressively with a systemic agent which might cause harm.
And so I think we really need the clinical picture at all times. Is the patient losing hair? If so, let's treat aggressively. If the patient isn't losing hair, then the biopsy does not dictate what we should do. And so these are wonderful studies which are teaching us that there is pathological changes in other areas of the scalp. And so we have these very nice studies looking at the normal appearing scalp. What do we do with this information? It's not clear. Both Dr. Doce and this particular study I've reviewed now mention that there's perifollicular fibrosis seen in the normal appearing scalp. It's not clear to me what to do with that information. Perifollicular fibrosis is so common, especially in androgenetic hair loss. 50 to 80% of patients with androgenetic hair loss have perifollicular fibrosis. They have inflammation in the infundibulum. And so future studies really need to try to differentiate what's happening in FFA in patients with androgenetic hair loss and what's happening in FFA in patients that don't have androgenetic hair loss because a lot of this perifollicular fibrosis and inflammation may just be a reflection of coexistent androgenetic hair loss. I don't think we fully know what that means. But the key takeaway message here is that the normal appearing scalp has these changes that are happening very, very similarly to what's happening in the active FFA appearing area. So from FFA, let's move on and talk about lichen plano pilaris and talk about checkpoint inhibitors. Checkpoint inhibitors are these new class of drugs that we've talked about in prior episodes of the Evidence-Based Hair podcast. And these are revolutionary new drugs, which are used in many, many cancers, metastatic cancers, which are changing lives which are allowing patients with very serious metastatic disease to uh, live longer and longer. And there's now many, many of these checkpoint inhibitor drugs. These drugs form a class of treatment called immunotherapy. And immunotherapy with drugs known as anti-program cell death, anti-PD-1 drugs, anti-CTLA-4 antibody-based drugs, is now becoming a standard therapy for many different malignancies. And so to understand how these drugs work, we really need to understand what is known as checkpoints. And when we understand what checkpoints are, we can understand what these checkpoint inhibitor drugs are all about. And so immune checkpoints are a normal part of the immune system. The role of these checkpoints is to prevent the immune response from being so strong that it destroys healthy cells inside the body. So we have these checkpoints that exist in the body. And we have proteins on the surface of T cells called immune checkpoint proteins, which bind to proteins on the surface of cancer cells called partner proteins. And when a T cell checkpoint protein binds to a, a partner protein, the T cell is ultimately sent a signal to settle down and don't kill the cancer cell. And so clearly that's not a good thing in oncology. We don't want T cells to settle down. We want them to be activated to, in fact, kill a cancer cell. And so we have this new class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors, which blocks these checkpoint proteins from binding to partner proteins on cancer cells. And by preventing these T cells from binding these partner proteins, the T cell is not told to be quiet, and the T cell can be allowed to be active and go about killing cancer cells. And so we have these new class of anti-PD-1 drugs, anti-CTLA-4 drugs, which bind to T cells and prevent T cells from going quiet. And so we have all of these new medications. We're going to talk about several today because several of these drugs are causing scarring alopecia and as well as many autoimmune diseases. We're going to talk about nivolumab, pembrolizumab, uh, as, as well as some others. But there's several of these checkpoint inhibitor drugs. And these particular checkpoint inhibitor drugs can activate the immune system and they can cause autoimmune diseases they can cause lichenoid skin reactions. 
in about 17% of patients. And they can cause lichenoid skin reactions like lichen plano pilaris, but also lichen planus of the skin, hypertrophic lichen planus, lichenoid dermatitis, lichen planus pemphigoides. So all these different lichenoid type skin reactions can occur with these checkpoint inhibitors. So oncologists are coming to know lichen plano pilaris in ways that they didn't know before because these checkpoint inhibitor drugs are causing lichen plano pilaris in a small percentage. We don't actually know how frequent it is, but oncologists are becoming aware of this and they're publishing these, these studies, these patients in the oncology literature as well as in the dermatology literature. So there are studies that we've talked about in prior episodes of lichen plano pilaris happening with these anti-PD-1 drugs. We have studies in 2018 by Kogan and colleagues, studies in 2021, uh, studies in 2022, which we reviewed before in prior episodes. And now we have a new study by Brosh and colleagues of three new patients. Two presenting with LPP after use of a checkpoint inhibitor, and one presenting with FFA. The first study of FFA happening associated with checkpoint inhibitors. So the first patient they describe is a 62-year-old woman who had metastatic melanoma who was treated with two checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab and ipilimumab, and she developed FFA after about 2.5 months. And they show very nice pictures in this report, which is free online. And there was complete hair loss of the eyebrows along with the frontal temporal hairline. A biopsy showed findings consistent with FFA. The patient was treated with topical clobetazole, a topical steroid. She didn't want to go on systemic treatment like hydroxychloroquine, Nivolumab was discontinued after 1.5 years, and after three years, she is still in remission from her metastatic lung disease. The FFA, however, is progressing. What's so remarkable about this study is that this patient, after 2.5 months, if I read this correctly, this patient developed three, four centimeter recession of the hairline along with eyebrow loss. Now, either these checkpoint inhibitor drugs can cause a rapid, rapid, rapid form of FFA, or this patient, in fact, had FFA that was subclinical, and when she started these checkpoint inhibitors, her FFA accelerated and became clinically apparent. Both are possible. We know that many patients with FFA are completely unaware they have FFA for many, many years. FFA usually causes recession of the frontal hairline, maybe a few millimeters each year, at most a centimeter. But to see four centimeters of recession in two and a half months would be considered remarkable. It certainly could be, and that's what the authors present in this study. It certainly comes as a shock to me because we generally don't see that rapid of FFA, but that is the data we're presented with. The second patient in the study is a, a patient who's 76, treated with melanoma of the paranasal sinus, received pembrolizumab, the checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab, for two years. After two years, she presents with scarring alopecia. She was treated with topical clobetazole. It helped tremendously. And after a period of 2.5 years, she um, stopped pembrolizumab and she was in remission. And so again, the authors present photographs of these patients with scarring alopecia from the checkpoint inhibitor, showing nice clinical pictures, nice trichoscopy type pictures or magnified images showing very typical lichen plano pilaris with pembrolizumab. Third patient is a patient treated with nivolumab. Patient was 63-year-old woman with malignant melanoma. She was treated with nivolumab. After 16 weeks, four months, she presents with biopsy-proven LPP. 
She was treated with clobetazole, and she had rapid improvement in her itching, and she was able to continue the nivolumab. So three new cases of scarring alopecia with checkpoint inhibitors, one developing after 2.5 months, one developing after two years, and one developing after 16 weeks. So quite a bit of variability. I think these, these studies are very important. Clearly, these checkpoint inhibitors cause a variety of lichenoid reactions. They are causing scarring alopecia in a proportion of patients. I don't think we fully understand what the number is. Is it 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 0.1%? I don't think we know yet. But I think we have to be on the lookout for this, and I think we have to be uh, able to assist our oncology colleagues very quickly because some of these patients may progress very quickly. If this patient developed four centimeters of hairline recession in 2.5 months, that would be among the most rapid FFA that exists. And I think that's very important and itself deserves further study. But um, three very helpful new studies of lichenoid type reactions in patients treated with checkpoint inhibitors. How do we treat scarring alopecia in the setting of checkpoint inhibitors? Well, we want to respect the fact that these patients have cancer, and so we need to be careful about suppressing the immune system too much, but topical steroids, steroid injections, topical tacrolimus, doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine can be helpful. We talked in the past about the fact that in rare cases, hydroxychloroquine can prolong the QT interval, affect heart rhythms. Some of the checkpoint inhibitors can as well. We need to be aware of that. So if we're using hydroxychloroquine in patients with checkpoint inhibitors, we may want to have an ECG done before. But these studies and the prior studies teach us that many patients with scarring alopecia from checkpoint inhibitors do fairly well with their scarring alopecia with uh, treatment, uh, including topical steroids, steroid injections, and so that should certainly be the starting point. From checkpoint inhibitors, we move on to a fascinating study by Dr. Cristiano's group at Columbia looking at three groups of genes that may be relevant to scarring alopecias in general that we didn't really appreciate this overlap as much as we will today when we review this study. So a study by Wang and colleagues in PNAS Nexus in July 2022. So there's several types of primary scarring alopecias. You know them as lichen plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, discoid lupus, folliculitis decalvans, dissecting cellulitis, and we spend a lot of time trying to separate these and figure out how does LPP differ, differ from FFA? How does FFA differ from CCCA? But a new study teaches us that perhaps these primary scarring alopecias have more in common than we realize. In some ways, that doesn't come as a surprise because even though we spend a lot of time trying to differentiate all these scarring alopecias, at the end of the day, we often treat many of them so similarly. And so we think folliculitis decalvans is a dramatically different condition from lichen plano pilaris, which it is. But at the end of the day, we use doxycycline to treat both. We use topical steroids to treat both. We, treat, we use steroid injections to treat both. And now new data teaches us that, hey, you can use JAK inhibitors to treat both. So there is clearly more overlap in these conditions than we appreciate. The pathogenesis may be different, at least we think it's different, but treatments are similar. And a new study teaches us that and for many of these scarring alopecias, Maybe the pathogenesis is more similar than we realize. So Dr. Cristiano's group set out to perform a new study dealing uh, using high-throughput RNA sequencing 
on scalp biopsies of patients with LPP, FFA, CCCA, to look at gene expression signatures. Are patients with FFA, LPP, and CCCA, are they in fact expressing certain genes more in commonly than we realized? And so they collected tissue sample from 30 LPP patients, 36 FFA patients, 9 CCCA patients, and compared them to 12 controls. And the authors wanted to determine if there are shared gene signatures or transcription type signatures in patients with LPP, FFA, and CCCA. And what they found is that there are. And these shared gene signatures or how these genes are expressed are fairly similar in LPP, FFA, and CCCA, and they're different compared to the controls. And so the pathway analyses and, and the Im immune panel studies show that there's three main pathways that are relevant here. And in all three of these scarring alopecias, there's a significant over-representation of mast cell genes, a down-regulation of cholesterol pathways, and an upregulation of fibrosis genes or scarring genes. And so when they look at the gene expression of mast cells, scarring pathways, fibrosis pathways, cholesterol pathways, and what genes are upregulated, downregulated, they're surprisingly similar in LPP compared to FFA and CCCA. You would expect these three conditions to be different because they're different scarring alopecias, but much to the surprise in this study, they're somewhat identical. So the authors use this term that suggests that there's this signature, there's this overlapping mast cell signature, fibros fibrosis signature, and cholesterol signature that is shared in common with FFA, LPP, and CCCA. And the mast cell signature suggests that mast cells, these allergy cells, are particularly relevant to FFA, LPP, and CCCA. And many of these mast cell-related genes appear to be involved in FFA, LPP, and CCCA. And the authors found positive staining for mast cells in biopsies from LPP, FFA, and CCCA. The staining was around the sebaceous glands and within the scar tissue, in the fibrosis tissue, which doesn't come as a surprise necessarily because we know mast cells are involved to some degree in fibrosis, in triggering fibrosis. So overall, this data is consistent with the fact that mast cells are involved in some way in LPP, FFA, and CCCA. And so the presence of mast cells in LPP, FFA, and CCCA suggests that there's possibly some trigger of innate immune responses that potentially involve allergy mechanisms. We've come to think that maybe there's some sort of allergic trigger in some patients with FFA and LPP, because some of our patients with LPP and FFA get better when we put them on hypoallergenic products. Not everybody, but some very nice data over the last few years has shown that some patients with FFA and LPP are allergic to certain ingredients, and some come up positive to various patch testing chemicals, fragrance, preservatives, etc. So we know that for some patients, yes, allergy seems to be important. And some of our scarring alopecia patients are getting better with allergy medications like antihistamines, including cetirizine. But we don't think about allergy as a mechanism in CCCA yet, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, perhaps because we haven't really studied it. But this study suggests that mast cell-related mechanisms and allergy mechanisms are probably very relevant to these three scarring alopecias.
And so this study fuels the hypothesis that maybe environmental factors like allergens are involved in the pathogenesis of primary scarring alopecia, and perhaps mast cells are involved in fibrosis. The study also shows that there's a downregulation of cholesterol type pathways. There's a differentially expressed pattern of genes in cholesterol biosynthesis, fatty acid biosynthesis. Specifically, there's a decrease in cholesterol biosynthesis. And this is thought to tie in with the loss of sebaceous glands or decreased sebum production that we're all aware of in scarring alopecia. And there's an upregulation of fibrosis related genes. And this is similar in LPP, FFA, and CCCA. In fact, the signature is nearly identical. And that's really the key point in this study, is that when you look at how these genes are differentially expressed, they're so similar in FFA, LPP, and CCCA. And again, clinically, we think of these conditions as differently. Each day of the clinic, CCCA is a condition that occurs in black women aged 35 to 60 with afrotextured hair, affects the central scalp. FFA is a condition of women 45 to 60, affecting the frontal hairline, but also the eyebrows, eyelashes, body hair. LPP affects younger women and men, affects the central scalp. And so clinically, we think of these conditions as somewhat differently, but this, this study by Dr. Cristiano's group tells us that they have much more in common than we realize. I think this data is really, really encouraging because it reminds us that treatments may overlap and that treatments that help FFA might help LPP, as we know, but they also may help CCCA, and that perhaps we need to focus now on treatments that upregulate cholesterol pathways, treatments that reduce fibrosis, and treatments that target mast cells. Clearly, we're using treatments that target mast cells. We're using cetirizine in the clinic all the time. We know other treatments that we use, like JAK inhibitors, also target mast cells. We, knew, we know that some of the treatments, like PPAR gamma agonists, may also affect some of these cholesterol-type pathways. Fibrosis is a huge subject, and many fields of medicine are, are looking at fibrosis. There's fibrosis that plays an important role in heart disease, in lung disease, in liver disease. And so clearly, new drugs are going to be coming to market in all of these different fields of medicine. And some of these drugs which reduce fibrosis may have a role in our field to reduce fibrosis in scarring alopecia. Lipid metabolism is a very important subject in the cardiovascular world, in other parts of medicine as well, in endocrinology. And so clearly, medications that affect cholesterol biosynthesis are going to play an important role potentially in scarring alopecia. And so this is a really interesting study. These three scarring alopecias that were studied here may have more in common than we realize. And so finally, we move on to study number eight, a nice study looking at alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp, AANS, also known as pseudocysts. What are pseudocysts? Well, let me paint a picture for you. Imagine a 25-year-old male that comes into clinic with nodules in the scalp. The patient has seen several physicians, and it appears to be dissecting cellulitis. The patient is concerned with everything they've read about dissecting cellulitis, that this needs urgent attention because it it's a challenging condition to treat. The patient wants to be put on the right therapy because they don't want it to spread. You prescribe the patient doxycycline. You perform steroid injections. Three months later, the patient comes back with full hair growth. 
Treatment is stopped. Hair growth remains. The condition doesn't come back. Was this dissecting cellulitis? Well, this was probably alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp. This was probably pseudocysts, which mimics dissecting cellulitis. And many people, including myself, think that it's a mild, mild variant of dissecting cellulitis. So let's talk about this fascinating condition. It's a condition that's important to know about because if you get the patient on the right treatment, you can get dramatic hair regrowth quickly, and patients don't go on to have the same story that patients with dissecting cellulitis have. So Dr. Trube's group reported this very nice study in the International Journal of Trichology titled Alopecic and Aseptic Nodules of the Scalp, a new entity or a minor form of dissecting cellulitis. And it's free online. You may want to check it out. The pictures are very nice. The story by which dissecting, by which alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp came to be is interesting. In 1992, Iwata described pseudocysts in the Japanese literature and that was in the Japanese Journal of Clinical Dermatology. It would be a number of years, not till 1998, that Chevalier reported the same phenomenon at a meeting and published it in the French literature. Another author in 2005, Jesuruta, published a study of pseudocysts, wondering if this was a new entity. And then Dr. Regagne and colleagues coined the term alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp in 2009 and published a case series, unifying everything suggesting that pseudocysts and alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp are in fact the same thing. It's thought by many that this is a form of dissecting cellulitis. When you hold your trichoscope trichoscope to the scalp in a patient with aseptic nodules or pseudocysts, it looks just like dissecting cellulitis. It is very similar to dissecting cellulitis, and so it's reasonable to consider it as a minor form or a, or a variant with excellent prognosis. It is a variant that responds extremely, extremely well to treatment, and generally with doxycycline, steroid injections, topical clindamycin with steroids, and rarely other treatments like isotretinoin. Hair regrowth occurs rapidly. And sometimes you just need steroid injections. But generally, I will encourage the patient to pursue a short course of doxycycline with steroid injections. And this contrasts from dissecting cellulitis, which tends to have a more recalcitrant course, tends to go on longer, tends to be more refractory to therapy. So the main location for pseudocysts or alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp is the occiput, the upper vertex. Patients can have one nodule or a few nodules. They drain pus, but when you culture the pus, it comes back negative. The pathology looks very similar to dissecting cellulitis. It's a mixed picture with a an inflammatory infiltrate with many types of inflammatory cells. It's not necessarily pathognomonic. So when you biopsy an alopecic and aseptic nodule or a pseudocyst, and you write on your pathology report, pathology report, dear pathologist, is this alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp? I'm wondering. The pathologist does not write back. Yes, it is. The pathologist writes back. This is a mixed picture with multiple inflammatory cells, neutrophils, perhaps some granulomas. Uh, and so it's up to you to tie in the picture together. There may be features which the pathologist suggests. If you're thinking dissecting cellulitis, it could be. This is a deep picture. But you need to have a clinical suspicion in order to make the ultimate diagnosis of alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp. So I would encourage you to check out the paper in the International Journal of Trichology.
It shows some very nice pictures of alopecic and aseptic nodules with these vertex located nodules, which are fluctuant, which are boggy, and respond very well to treatment. So Dr. Trube's group describes 26 patients that they've seen over the past 10 years. Most patients were male and Caucasian. Age ranges from 18 to 48. And most patients responded well to doxycycline or isotretinoin. We don't use the two together because of a rare side effect. Increased cerebral tension, hypertension. Dr. Troop's group also was reported that interlesional steroids worked well, and together doxycycline or isotretinoin or steroids caused complete hair regrowth or partial hair regrowth in a large proportion of patients. Some were treated with topical antibiotics. The authors felt that the condition was so obvious that they didn't need to perform scalp biopsy. And so it's good news when you see a patient with alopecia and aseptic nodules of the scalp because often the response to treatment is very good. Hair regrowth occurs in a large proportion of patients and many patients come back for follow-up very pleased with the results and hair regrowth is the norm, at least to a large degree. And if you catch it early enough, you really expect patients to come back with full regrowth. So it's a very satisfying condition to treat because the outcomes are so good and many of these patients have gone months and months and months with being very afraid that they have dissecting cellulitis and the referring physicians are not clear exactly what they should do. Should they start um, you know, isotretinoin? Should they start a biologic because they heard biologics are great for dissecting cellulitis? What, should, what workup should they do? And to be told that this, these are pseudocysts or alopecia and aseptic nodules of the scalp is really great news. So, it's important to recognize alopecia and aseptic nodules of the scalp. Most patients have a few nodules on the vertex area. They drain pus, send them off for culture, but the culture usually comes back in negative. Biopsies are not specific, but they show this mixed infiltrate. Patients can start on doxycycline, topical steroids, steroid injections. Often I mix 2% clindamycin into clobetazole or betamethasone if the patient doesn't have allergies to clindamycin. And so that's it for this week. We have reviewed eight interesting studies in scarring alopecia. We've talked about comorbidities that exist in LPP. We've talked about the conic study from 2021 and how this ties in with these two new studies looking at comorbidities in LPP. Do patients with LPP have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, cancer, skin cancer? Do they have an increased risk for inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus? Do they have an increased risk for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis? Those seem to be increased markedly. I think this is the start of a new era looking at these comorbidities in LPP, and I think these are two valuable studies which add to the literature which remind us that there's probably more that we need to think about when we treat LPP than treating the scalp alone. We talked about eyebrow prognosis in FFA and a study from Mayo telling us that eyebrow loss is associated with a more refractory response to treatment. Dr. Goldberg's study shows that FFA may be affecting younger and younger patients, and certainly in her group of almost 300 patients, over time, the youngest patient that year is getting younger and younger. We talked about a study looking at the normal appearing scalp in FFA and reviewed also Dr. Doce's very nice study from 2020 in experimental dermatology, reminding us that the normal appearing scalp in FFA is also abnormal. And more studies are needed to help us understand what that means and if there's any clues in the normal scalp that tell us that that area is going to go on to lose hair in the next two, three, five, ten years and we need to do something about it now. We don't have that data yet. We talked about checkpoint inhibitors and the fact that these checkpoint inhibitor drugs are allowing patients with metastatic cancer to live longer and longer and are revolutionizing the oncology field.
but they're activating the immune system not only to kill cancer cells, but they're activating the immune system and causing autoimmune disease. And we need to be aware of autoimmune scarring alopecia with these checkpoint inhibitors. How common is it? We don't know yet. Talked about a fascinating study, a study number seven from Dr. Cristiano's group, telling us that these clinically different conditions, LPP, FFA, CCCA, share a common gene signature. The genes for mast cells, the gene signature fibrosis for fibrosis, the gene signature for cholesterol biosynthesis are all very similar. And perhaps if we can develop new treatments targeting mast cells, new treatments down-regulating fibrosis and up-regulating cholesterol biosynthesis in the way that we want, perhaps we can treat scarring alopecia more effectively. And finally, study eight was a study of alopecia and aseptic nodules of the scalp. Dr. Trube's very nice report of his experience with 26 patients over a long period of time and the fact that most patients do very, very well and we need to be aware of this entity. Let us know what you think about our podcast anytime. We appreciate your feedback. You can connect with the Donovan Hair Academy by email at info at donovanhairacademy.com. Next week we're back. It's the fourth Monday of the month, and we'll be reviewing a variety of studies that have been published in the last few months. And I will look forward to welcoming you back here on the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast.